Welcome everyone to the 2024 Vision Spectre Conference. Thank you all so much for joining us. And in this session, you'll hear from Ethan Eide, a sales and marketing specialist at COA American Corporation. Ethan has over 12 years of experience developing scientific systems and is joining us today to help viewers optimize lens selection for both hyperspectral and multispectral imaging. If you have any questions or comments, you can type them right into the conference chat box that is on your screen. And if you missed part of today's session, you can always come back later and watch it on demand. That's all from me, Ethan. We appreciate you taking the time to present at the fourth annual Vision Spectra Conference. So multi and hyperspectral imaging. I'd like to just talk a little bit about the basics and the differences between the two. One is that while well, they're both used to collect information across a wide area of the electromagnetic spectrum, hyperspectral imaging typically can measure a continuous spectral range. An example might be 400 nanometers to 100, 1100 or further with high resolution, and you can collect a, a spectral fingerprint for each pixel. Multispectral imaging often captures data over a wider spectrum, but with less resolution and or more spaced out spectral bands. So I think of it as taking a series of images of the same object with multiple filters. Um, some examples of this on the lower left, you can see a, an image from JPL at NASA, which is from a hyperspectral imaging satellite. This is called a data cube. Where showing a representation of the spectral fingerprint for each pixel in that image. Whereas on the right is from another satellite of the sun. You can see the sun looks very different. So this picture is very effective for catching different spectral bands and seeing what the sun looks like and what it's emitting in different spectral regions, but it's not a continuous image. It's, it's multiple kind of slices of the pie. Now, some ways that spectral resolution in, is different between hyperspectral and multispectral is that hyperspectral, the data is typically captured across hundreds of narrow spectral bands, which can provide a detailed spectrum for each pixel, and you'll typically have a continuous spectrum there. Multispectral, again, captures data across a no smaller number of wider spectral bands. So these may be contiguous, but typically they're spaced out. Some applications could be hyperspectral imaging will be more detailed, uh, the data, so this makes it better suited for cases where complex identification is required, and multispectral may be sufficient for less detailed or simpler analyses, cases where a broad variety of wavelengths are required, but detailed spectra and that data is not required. Sometimes in astronomy or in the orbital pictures we looked at, that may be as simple as having a filter wheel working on a conventional sensor with different notch filters to capture those bands. So optics are very important in hyperspectral and multispectral imaging or any wide, sort of wideband imaging to make sure that you're getting the most performance out of your system you can. Uh, for spectral accuracy, the lens must transmit light reliably. You don't want it to introduce aberrations and you want it to maintain spectral fidelity. For image quality, optics are used to determine clarity, the sharpness, and the overall quality of the spectral data collected. Resolution and distortion. So matching your lens to a camera's resolution, and we'll talk about all these later as well, this will maximize the ability to capture details while minimizing geometric distortion that can affect data quality. And then sensor compatibility. You really want your optics to be compatible with the sensor size, the pitch, and provide the appropriate field of view to meet specific application requirements. Okay, so spectral range is something that's very important when you're doing hyperspectral range. You really want to define your spectral range of interest as this helps optimize your lens choice. And lens choice should be a compatible with that spectral range of the camera. Now, the lens design, lenses are often optimized for performance at specific wavelengths, including transmission and optical clarity. Now, we'll get more into this a little later, but this can be the materials that are used, the design of the lens, as we said, and some coatings and things like that. The Some lenses may be optimized for UV or wideband or near IR or SWIR. And if you're trying to capture something outside those areas, then you may have issues with, with your acquisition and in the end, the quality of your data. Again, accurate data, that's the goal of any sort of imaging, right? Lenses need to efficiently transmit light through this entire spectrum that you're intending to capture without introducing errors or or other issues. Low performing lenses can sometimes introduce errors in the spectral data that will make analysis more difficult later. These can be from loss of signal or from aberrations 
sample ID as well. Um, the lenses, if they introduce things like spectral distortions or attenuations, the signal can uh, be affected and possibly maybe you could have an incorrect subject analysis after the acquisition. Okay, so transmission to build on the spectral range that we've defined. Careful selection of lenses with a suitable transmission properties for the intended spectral range is really essential for optimizing hyperspectral or multispectral imaging systems. Lens transmission can affect hyperspectral imaging in several ways that we'll talk about. Uh, spectral range, so we already spoke about this before, but the lens material and coatings need to transmit light within the spectral range of the hyperspectral camera you're using. If you have poor transmission outside of the visible spectrum, you can have your work basically hindered, uh, especially in areas like near IR or SWEAR. So this is just an example of some different coatings that we'll put on lenses, and we'll talk about this later. But you can see that these different lenses are optimized for transmission in different bands. If you have one here, like a traditional uh, visible light coating and you're shooting out in the sphere you may not have any transmission at all or very low and then just like here with a with a single layer or multi-layer there are different coatings we'll use to make sure that you have the best results picking a, a lens with the appropriate transmission bands is going to make your life a lot easier conversely if you don't want to capture something like if you're doing imaging just in say near IR or sphere going with a lens like this one here will cut out a lot of that light that you're not interested in and help your signal to noise ratio. So again, signal strength, if you have higher transmission, this leads to a stronger signal and which can improve the signal to noise radio and your overall image quality. And then at the end of the day, just to hit on it again, as I mentioned before, talking about getting a good spectrum, good images, good quality, this will help your, your data be more accurate and make reliable sample analysis and identification much easier. Okay, optical coatings. One way that these lenses, as you can see before, we talked about this transmission graph of some of our COAS optical coatings, are by applying different coatings to the optics. Now, these can have several benefits and effects that can affect hyperspectral imaging. So anti, they can have anti-reflective properties. Coatings that we put on lenses are often applied to reduce reflections off lens surfaces, thereby increasing the amount of light transmitted through the lens. Now, this is crucial for hyperspectral imaging and multispectral imaging as it improves the light gathering capability of the system and the quality of your data. Again, enhance contrast as well. You can reduce stray light and reflections using these coatings, and this can help improve the image contrast, which is important for distinguishing subtle differences between spectra, so you can get sharper peaks this way in your spectral data. Minimizing lens flare and ghosting. So at the end of the day, right, we're, we're capturing image theoretically, but we're putting that into spectra after. So coatings can help reduce lens flare and ghosting, which can distort the image and will show up as artifacts in your spectral data. Then spectral flatness as well. Some coatings are, are designed to ensure that this wideband transmission, like this one here, this VisSphere coating, which is really good for hyperspectral imaging, it ensures that the transmission will be very flat across the whole band. This makes calibrating your data a bit easier and also um, just gives you a nice consistent signal. So ensuring your lens coatings are suitable for the spectral range intended for an intended application will help you achieve more reliable imaging results. Okay, there are several types of lens distortion commonly experienced. Lens distortion can affect hyperspectral imaging or multispectral imaging in the following ways. Geometric distortion is one of these. These distortions especially happen at the edges of an image, and they can alter the true shape of imaged objects. So one way you might see this in just, if you take an image of a field, a checkerboard, right, the, the squares would be nice and sharp in the middle, and then out at the end, they may be curved or bowed. I'm sure you've seen that. Think of like a fisheye effect, right, where you have intentional distortion. So finding a lens with, with low distortion is very important. On our lenses, we refer to it to on our spec sheets as TV distortion. And you'll see either positive or negative number. And the lower the distortion, it means that you'll have a flatter image across the whole field of view without that curving that you'll typically see less of a fisheye effect. This can reduce some of the inaccuracies in spatial measurements and analysis that you might have 
and improve your resolution. Spectral calibration. So lens distortion can also affect the accurate alignment of spectral data and its corresponding spatial location in your image. Uh, the misalignment here can basically reduce the precision of your spectral analysis. You'll have lower resolution spectra. So one way you can correct and calibrate this is that a lot of high quality imaging systems require some sort of distortion correction during the calibration process to ensure accurate representation of spectral data. Right, so an easy way to do this though is if you just start out by minimizing lens distortion, so using a lens with low, with low distortion in the first place, uh, will make it more easy. Calibration in algorithms used in a lot of software and computers can often correct for these distortions, but the better data you start with, the more easy it'll be to make sure that you have accurate and reliable results. So chromatic aberration affects hyperspectral imaging by causing different wavelengths of light to focus at different distances to the lens. You can see here in the diagram on the right that the different wavelengths are being reflected at different angles, which when you have a flat plane, such as a camera sensor, means that light from a single point in the image will actually hit different areas of the sensor. Now, what this will do, and where you'll see this, will be reduced sharpness, so significant aberration at the edges of a lens can cause the sh sharpness and reduction of the image to be reduced. The, the flatter the lens and, and the lower the distortion, you'll have less issues like this happening. Now, inaccurate spectra is also another side effect. So since each pixel in a hyperspectral image is actually containing spectral information, this chromatic aberration will distort some of the data you collect. So to minimize these effects, you really want to use lenses that are designed to correct or significantly reduce these chromatic aberrations. And this will help ensure the accuracy and reliability of your spectral data. Another example that we'll talk about here is color fringing. So different wavelengths, as we said, are refracted at different angles, and you'll see these misaligned spectra at the edges of objects, basically called color fringing. Just for an example of this, this is a picture of a building in Europe. Sometimes this is called, this chromatic aberration, as you said, is called chromatic distortion or color fringing. This photograph of this building on the right is an example of an image taken with a high quality lens and a lower quality wide angle lens using the same camera. Uh, you can see at the top image, the details are nice and crisp and clear and it shows minimal distortion. In the lower image taken with this lower quality wide angle lens with more distortion, you can see the chromatic aberration. There's some fringing and just blurrier in general. So if you imagine taking a, a spectral image of this lens or of this building, you'll have a bunch of um, better data with the top lens versus the bottom. I just like to see an actual representation like that. Okay, so one thing you'll notice too will be focus shift. So focus shift is a change of the plane of best focus with different wavelengths of light. Now this can affect images in, in several ways. So spectral blurring, if the camera is focused at one wavelength, other wavelengths, as we talked about before, might be out of focus, causing spectral blurring and loss of image detail. This is an image of one of from one of our visrear lenses that are commonly used for hyperspectral or multispectral imaging, any sort of visible sphere imaging you need to do. You can see here that basically between these two image, one shot invisible, one sphere, and there's a bit of difference in focus between those two points. Well, this one has it pretty consistently, but on a, a typical lens that isn't corrected for this, you may see it called IR corrected or, or just a wide band of this sphere lens. Then one of these will be much more out of focus. So this can lead to inaccuracy in data. So your spectral inaccuracy can occur because the spectral signal at each pixel might not represent the true characteristics of what's actually happening at that point in the image if the focus is wavelength dependent. This will also re result in reduced image quality if the image has variations in sharpness across the spectral range. You really want for hyperspectral imaging or multispectral imaging, any sort of wideband imaging to have as consistent a focus as possible to ensure you're getting consistent data acquisition. Now, IR corrected lenses, as we mentioned, or VisSphere lenses as well, are specifically designed to minimize or eliminate the effects of, say, infrared light on the image quality. 
where lenses, regular lenses are not. So this is a really nice image, a standard SWIR lens, and then one of our Viz SWIR lenses just to show you where if you're just imaging in SWIR, so the right image is 1650, but if you want to go into the visible as well, you can see the bottom image is pretty blurry. So if you're going to be capturing an image here for hyperspectral, your as you go into the visible, your your spectral resolution is going to drop off. Whereas if you have a lens that is focus corrected, then you're going to have a nice consistent focus and nice consistent spectral resolution across this whole thing. Now, the way we did this was we fixed the focus at 1650 and then changed the wavelength progressively across different different wavelengths so you can see how that changes. One other issue here could also be, you know, if you're taking the UV or somewhere else, right? Or if you're in the visible and then you're shooting also using a visible lens and you're going in the in the SWIR or the IR. This will have kind of the opposite effect. Now regular lenses, as you can see, they may have haze fonded, haze or fogging, maybe unwanted glare, some distortion in the images as we talked about, or artif imaging artifacts. Now, they also may not be optimized for use with things like IR cut filters or, or other, other systems. These IR corrected lenses or these wideband lenses, they're designed from the start to account for these refractive index differences. So you're going to have a better solution and a better result. Typically, they're made with special glass or materials that minimize distortion. And then they also may have special coatings or lens curvature positioning. I know our lenses have extra elements built in to take care of some of this, these issues that you'll commonly experience with a, with a regular lens. Now, what does this provide you? So could be low light conditions or applications where you're using IR illumination or sensing can be very helpful. Focal length is another important thing uh, in hyperspectral imaging that you want to look at when you're selecting a lens. So for field of view, typically a shorter focal length lens will provide a wider field of view, which is good if you're trying to capture a larger area in one frame, but you can also end up having some distortion and maybe less spatial detail on the sensor because you're covering a larger area, physical area, viewing area, onto the same size sensor. Now, a longer focal length will give you a narrower field of view, but that'll mean that the actual spatial area of what you're imaging is going to be smaller, which can give you better spatial re spatial resolution and better uh, detail on each sensor, on each pixel. So basically, as we said, the spatial resolution will determine is determined by the focal length of the system typically. Again, longer typically means higher spatial resolution. Finer details can be resolved in the image or in the spectra. And I, you really want to adjust this though to match your specific application, right? If you if you have too wide of a lens with a short focal length, you might be capturing data that you need or not getting enough detail. But if you have too long of one, then maybe you're capturing too much. And that's just an issue to think about. So really you want to find that best balance between what's my field of view I need and the spatial resolution that I need to achieve to be able to do my, my work. So for image clarity uh, is one thing you need to think about. So resolution, the resolution of the lens can determine how well fine details can be captured in the image. When you're thinking about this in spectra, right? What's the resolution gonna be of your, of your spectra? Um, how, how fine of points can you resolve? Typically higher resolutions, which you'll typically see on a spec sheet as lines per per millimeter, can resolve finer details, which is vital, vital for accurately characterizing material properties in hyperspectral imaging, or really any type of imaging. You also want to match it to the camera sensor. So lens resolution should be matched to the sensor resolution, or it'll be a limiting factor in the resolution of your data capture. You can have a super high resolution sensor with nice small sharp pixels, but if you don't have a camera that meets the resolution of that sensor, or at least of the at a minimum of the spectral resolution that you need, the spatial resolution that you need, then you're going to have artifacts. You might have some aliasing. You might uh, you just won't get get the the maximum performance out of your system. So really, it requires a combination of a high resolution lens, 
and a sensor that can capture fine details rendered by these lenses to get the best spectral results on your on your imaging. It's important to have a lens, again, that complements the camera's specifications so you can optimize it. Now, typically, this is summer two, and we'll talk about this later, but again, a lot of these things, if, you know, more doesn't hurt, but it can affect cost and, and other items like that on your, if you say your wish list, right, or your, your list of requirements. So find that balance. Okay, resolution. A lot of times we talk about the modular transfer function, the MTF. This describes the ability of a lens to resolve detail and contrast in a context of hyperspectral imaging. This is really important for several reasons. So the MTF can indicate the lens's ability to resolve fine details within the, within the scene that you're looking at, and especially at uh, certain wavelengths or, or spatial frequencies. So a higher MTF will mean better detail rendition, and this is essential when identifying, especially small features within a hyperspectral image, because you're not just looking at a single spectral, you're also looking at that spatial component. Now, it also affects image sharpness. So across the spectra, you want to ensure that you have basically the best spectral data you can per pixel. Sharp images will ensure this, and a good high MTF will make this as accurate as possible without blur blurring or spectral crosstalk between different, different pixels or regions of the image. It also gives you an idea of contrast at different spatial frequencies. So hyperspectral imaging really demands and requires consistent contrast over various frequencies. And a lens with a high MTF value will typically perform better across the complete field of the image and the spectrum. You really want to ensure that hyperspectral imaging results are as good as you can have them, and it's important to use a lens with an appropriate MTF for the application. And again, just getting back to matching the camera sensor, uh, lens resolution MTF should be sufficient to meet the camera sensor's capabilities. I know I keep hitting on this, but you know if you have a really low resolution sensor, then maybe you don't need the highest resolution lens, uh, but you don't want something below it if you're trying to maximize the performance on that sensor. Okay, so the aperture F number in optical systems, including hyperspectral imaging, is going to affect several factors. So depth of field, sharpness, resolution, and light gathering. Now, in depth of field, the F number is going to affect this by a lower F number is going to result in a shallower depth of field, but a higher F number is going to increase the depth of field. So hyperspectral imaging, this property can be crucial if you're trying to focus on a specific target, a specific distance, while maybe blurring out other areas. Uh, using an aperture that's too wide or too narrow can really affect your spectral sharpness. Maybe it will give you extra diffraction or lens aberrations. So you really need to affect the, you need this optimized for the specific application, and you really want to ensure the right balance of light gathering and image sharpness. It's really an important part of the camera setup and the calibration. Uh, wider apertures are going to allow more light to pass in, which means more signal, which can really benefit in low light situations. But you also want to manage this because you don't want to have overexposure, which might blow out or bleed into other areas of your image. Cost is something that maybe it doesn't affect the direct quality of your lens, but if, especially if you're providing this as a commercial solution or a quote for a customer or a project you have a budget for, then looking at things like the optical quality higher cost lenses often provide better performance including higher resolution lower distortion and better chromatic aberration they can also have better spectral transmission an expensive lens might do that better than a cheap lens more accurately and then the build quality so koa has lenses that are resistant to shock and vibration oil so you need to think about that too is the lens going to hold up over a long time what's the environment that it's going to be in but more expensive lenses don't always mean that your system will be better. So you really need to look at all of the things we've talked about and say, what are my specific needs? What are my requirements? And where's the best balance of cost and performance so I can have the best solution? Okay, one thing I did wanna hit on was regular versus focus corrected lenses. Several methods we used for building focus corrected lenses include specific lens elements, floating element design, and special low dispersion glass, and then the coatings we use. There are several types of lenses we use in these, including aspherics to lower distortion, again, floating elements design, and low dispersion glass, which, which makes the 
different wavelengths of light travel more consistently through through the optics. So I did want to hit on just as an example quickly here the floating mechanism design that we use in some of our systems here at COA. And this is used in a lot of our CCTV lenses and then also a lot of our machine vision lenses as well. Uh, this floating mechanism designs can vary, you can vary the distance between lens elements as you as you change the focus. And this helps achieve the highest performance at various objective distances. It also can significantly improve wide spectrum imaging performance in several ways. One, you'll have improved spectral resolution because the floating elements move independently. The lens can maintain optimal focus and correction across a wide spectral range. And this results in higher resolution and accuracy. And then you'll also reduce spectral smearing. So floating optics help minimize spectral smearing, as we said, which occurs when different wavelengths aren't precisely aligned, which can cause spectral information to be lost. Again, it'll also help your spatial resolution. The floating design will enable better correction of aberrations, which leads to improved spatial resolution and sharper images. And then you can also have through, increased throughput. So we optimize the optical path or any, any lens that uses this design has an optimized optical path. This will increase the throughput of light. So you're reducing light loss and you can improve your signal to noise ratio because you have more photons actually getting to the sensor, which can come out in better signal to noise, as we said, or faster data acquisition, reduced exposure times. We'll reduce stray light. So floating elements minimize stray light, which can contaminate spectral data and reduce image quality. And then you have also have improved radiometric accuracy. So because we're maintaining really precise control over the optical path, floating designs enable more accurate radiometric measurements. And this is really important for hyperspectral and multispectral imaging applications. Uh, wider spectral range as well. So typically these floating optics, because as we said, they're kind of adaptive to a wide spectral range and a wide range of focuses, you can capture more comprehensive spectral data with the same lens. So again, at the end of the day, our goal of using lenses like these is to improve your data quality and your analytical capabilities. You can see here, just to give you an idea, floating, the quality of the image here, it's kind of an empirical image, but without floating, this will be the distance. With floating optics, you have a nice consistent band across distance and uh, of the lens and focus depth. You can see here as well, and on the left, that uh, lenses with the floating optics will move. You can see that the pieces will change from the initial position. Hope that was helpful for you. Again, my name is Ethan Ide. I'm a sales and marketing specialist at COA. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or go to our websites. My email and number is right here. And I appreciate your time today and look forward to talking to you about any of your imaging needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethan, for helping viewers better understand how to select the right lens for both hyperspectral and multispectral imaging. Just to echo your statement real quick to everyone in our audience, you can either reach out to Ethan directly on the email provided. You can also type your questions and comments into the conference chat box that is on your screen. And do not worry if you have not been answered yet, you'll be reached via email at a later date. This session is hosted by us at Photonics Media, and we hope you're enjoying the fourth annual Vision Spectra Conference. Thank you all so much for joining us.